So good day, everyone. Welcome to today's APSC CME webinar series, an ECG case presentation and competition for submitting fellows across the Asia Pacific. This content is organized by the APSC, endorsed by the Singapore Cardiac Society, EBEC accredited for CME points in collaboration with Abbott. A date stem today is the 11th of March, Friday, 2022, 6 p.m. Singapore time, in conjunction with APSC 2022. Congress. So uh, again, uh, my name is Jack Tan, the immediate past president for the Asian Pacific Society of Cardiology, your chair for today. We're very privileged to have our two judges, expert electrophysiologist, Dr. Sophia Joha, senior consultant, interventional cardiologist, electrophysiologist, structural heart specialist from Grand Eagles uh, JPMC, Brunei. My second chief judge is Professor Chin Chi Kyung, a good friend of mine, the Director of Electrophysiology and Pacing Section at the National Heart Center Singapore. And we are very happy to have seven presenters today, respectively in country order, Dr. Teng Lang En from Australia, Melbourne, never skip a beat. Dr. Anissa from uh, Indonesia is gonna present on how to determine the block site in the AV2 to 1 hub block on the 12 lead ECG. Dr. Pham from Kedah, Malaysia, is going to talk about is it SVT or VTs. We have Dr. Chi Wee Sun from Malaysia, Sedang, as well. His presenting uh, topic is looks like me, sounds like me, but it's not me. So, very keen to hear what that was about. Dr. Julian Tay is from the Singapore National Heart Center, presenting on the case of white complex. Tachycardia. Dr. Go Fang Ching from the National University Heart Center is going to present on the case of exertional dyspnea with T inversions on the ECG. And last but not least, we have Dr. Cheng Wei Lian from uh, Taiwan National University Hospital. He's going to talk about ECG on activating the cath lab or not. A disclaimer this content is copyrighted by the APSC. The views and opinions expressed here belongs to the faculty and not necessarily that of the APSC. This webinar is live streamed by Wonder APSC Facebook and YouTube pages. CME points will then be submitted for those who are connected throughout the full duration of this Zoom webinar. You will then receive your certificate of attendance upon completing a survey sent by email post webinar. Please do click on to the Q&A box below if you have any questions, and we'll try to answer all of them as much as possible. A pitch for upcoming webinars on the 18th of March, we have a MET master program on the latest evidence for high bleeding risk PCI as well as renal denovation. 26th of March, we have a transcontinental chip case sharing club test. This session is very um, unique. We're gonna feature women at the helm. So let's get started for today. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Ting from Australia to present the first case. Never skip a beat. Dr. Ting, please. Uh, yeah, please uh, share your presentation. Uh, Sorry, it looks good. Please go ahead. All right, no worries. Um, okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Tang. I'm, I'm the basic physician trainee um, from Peninsula Health in Melbourne, Australia. And today I'll be presenting on um, Never to Keep a Beat for the ECG case competition. Um, so I'll, I'll crack on. So we have the 84 years old man who presented initially with inferior STEMI that was complicated by junctional bradycardia and cardiogenic shock. Um, a temporary pacing wire was inserted. Uh, initially by a right femoral vein. It was set at a VVI mode at 50 beats per minute with an output of five volts and a sensitivity of three millivolts. It was transferred to um, the cath lab urgently for an angiogram. Um, initially, it shows a completely occluded um, right proximal RCA, um, and there was severe bystander disease in the first diagonal vessel, um, but no other angiographically significant coronary stenosis in other epicardial arteries. So um, one drug eluting stent was deployed over the RCA and following restoration of the um, right coronary artery flow, patient's hemodynamic actually um, improved and um, 
um, and there was complete resolution of the ST segment. So as the patient was transit out of the cath lab, he actually developed a white compensate cardiac with lots of output, and it, he required a defibrillation of one single 200 joule shock. And he attend, um, attend Ross after that single shock. So the screen that you're seeing right now basically shows the reading strip prior to the cardiac arrest. And I just thought it would be interesting that I gave some multiple choices in this scenario to consider what are the possible uh, interventions that you will offer. So would you consider amiodarone for this patient? Would you consider magnesium? Would you remove the temporary pacing wire or would you repeat an urgent coronary angiogram urgently uh, for this patient? Um, so I guess let's just focus on the reading strip in greater details. So as you can see, the red rectangular box here basically shows the evidence of polymorphic VT or TOSATs. And just prior to that, if you focus on the blue arrow there, you can see that there's a pacing spike from um, the pacing wire that's causing an R and T phenomenon. And even before that, with the green arrow showing there, you could see that there's antisensing and inappropriate pacing by the pacing spike from the temporary pacing wire just prior to that, highlighted by the green arrow. And even during the onset of the polymorph VT itself, you could see that there's pacing spikes um, during the VT itself, highlighted by the red arrow over here. So for this patient, we actually think that it's, um, the polymorph VT was caused by the temporary pacing wires to remove it. Um, and there was no further VT event that was observed for this patient. He was then transferred to coronary care unit for about five days of observation. He was discharged from the hospital five days later without any further complications. So I guess the learning point for this case is that RNT phenomenon can occur due to poor myocardial sensing with pacing electrodes, likely placed in proximity with the infected right ventricular tissue. And I'll just like to point out, you know, this case is um, by no means complicated, but I think nevertheless an interesting one. And I guess can be easily missed, especially in the high acuity settings, such as the cath lab. Um, and it's, I don't think it's very uncommon in clinical practice. And I think it's an important phenomenon to always have the back of my mind, especially for cardiology registrar and international cardiologists. Um, so I'd like to take this opportunity to kind of thank Dr. Sean Tan and Dr. Roshan Prakash from uh, Peninsula Health in guiding me writing this case right up. And um, I'd like to thank the audience and the judges for listening in, and I'm happy to take any comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tang. That was a very nice case. Uh, this illustrates some very nice teaching points. Um, actually, uh, one thing this highlights is that when you place a temporary wire in someone with inferior ambien, inferior STEMI, and you're thinking RB infarction, you're right to think that perhaps there might be some issues with uh, capture and uh, sensing. So actually, if you look at the ECG strip closely, you can actually see pacing spikes spaced approximately, I guess, possibly 50 beats apart. So this actually shows a tracing of both failure of sensing and failure of capture, because you need to capture every time. And if it's, if it's um, not sensing properly, then it will deliver pacing spikes. So you see regular pacing spikes, uh, none, most of which don't capture, and some of which capture the myocardium fortuitously just at the end of the T wave, so R on T, triggering uh, sort of like VF, basically. Uh, so the QT is not particularly long here, actually, so it's probably a vulnerable heart. So my question to you a little bit is the sensing. Um, for a, the sensing was set at three millivolts. Uh, was there any consideration to adjusting that sensitivity, actually, rather than just taking a temporary wire out? Um, I, I think for, I think for, for, for this case, um, when we encountered the polymorphic VT, um, he wasn't really required pacing anymore, and there was complete resolution of the XT segment. Um, so at that time, I think the decision by the intervention of Kyle was just to remove it and observe. So there was a decision made there and then. But I guess you raise an important point. If we do dial up the sensitivity, then potentially you could, patient could be safely monitored in a CCU unit with a temporary pricing wire in. And in, in the case that if he does goes into a complete heart block due to the blockages, then I suppose it, it could be a, a good plan B or a backup for pacing? Yeah, so for something for the audience to note, the threshold was also fairly high. The threshold is presumably above five volts, so in, in general. So when you have something with poor sensing and uh, sort of like high threshold, the first thing you want to do is uh, reposition temporary wire. One of the things that you might want to be careful of in this kind of case is that uh, temporary wire perforation is fairly common 
uh, in the situation. So one of the reasons for the raised threshold for sensing actually is temporary wire perforation. So you need to watch out for that and look out for the temporary wire. Uh, so with that, I think, thank you very much, Dr. Tang. We'll have a further discussion later at the end of the session. Uh, but then we will move on to the next case. Uh, Chikyong, do you have a point? Yes, um, um, yeah. th thank you. Um, if you could flash your the slide, and then maybe you can just ask that for all presenters to just leave the slide, the ECG slide, as we discuss your ECG. Uh, a nice case, uh, RNT, if you could flash a slide where the, the polymorphic VT occurred, uh, I'd like to ask a few questions. I think uh, Dr. Sof Sofian uh, has really shared about how you could uh, reprogram the temporary pacemaker settings uh, to avoid this. I'd like to ask you, uh, if, if you're the rounding registrar or the senior MO every morning um, for a person with a temporary pacing wire placed at the RV, what are the things that you would do to check on the sensitivity, capture threshold, threshold, and how would that influence the programming of that temporary pacemaker? Um, yeah, to, to, to be honest, I'm not sure the answer to that question, but um, I, I, I guess I think I'll probably like, I mean, to probably just examine the patient and make sure that it's okay and review the travel ECG and look at the telemetry as well to see um, whether there's any failure of capture or sensing, just looking at the telemetry itself when looking at the patient. Um, I'll probably start with that. And I'm not really familiar about adjusting the sensitivity or voltages in this scenario, I'm sorry. All right, all right thanks. So um, I will advise all rounding physicians to check on the sensitivity so that you could program it accordingly. At three millivolts seems a little high and hence the temporary wire may understand in, in intrinsic R waves as shown in this case. Number two, yeah, I would like to define the capture, uh, capture threshold so that you could program it at least 2.5, two to three times above the capture threshold. And of course, you would like to do a sensing test to ascertain whether the patient requires pacing support on a regular basis. So these are things that we ought to do uh, and we can do to prevent this such inadvertent, inadequate sensing resulting in R and T phenomenon. Thank you very much. Thanks uh, both Chikyong and Sofian. Uh, we'll move on to Dr. Anissa from Indonesia. Thanks Dr. Anissa. Okay, um, a good evening, uh, and gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity for, um, for me to present the case. So uh, I would like to present uh, the case about how to determine the block size uh, in a, due to an AP block from to trial with ECG. So the case came from the female, uh, 62 years old, with this new for the for the last two months. Uh, the patient uh, have no history of the sign copy or piece and copy, and for uh, the last uh, her last uh, echocardiography showed the concentric left ventricle hypertrophy with the left ventricle ejection fraction is uh, 44 percent and with the non-significant uh, coronary artery disease. So here is uh, the ECG uh, from uh, this ECG. I think it's interesting because uh, uh, in the 221 AV block ECG, we have to determine the block site of 221 AV uh, uh, block because it can be uh, very important to decide the right treatment for the uh, patient, whether the patient is a permanent pacemaker or not. So, uh, and the surface ECG can help to uh, predict the block site. So here is the ECG that shows uh, the two to an AV block in conducted T waves with a constant P to P interval and the heart rate was about the 46 beat per minute. And the PR interval is 146 milliseconds with the left manual bench block and uh, the left axis deviation with the QS complex is about 149 milliseconds. So uh, these are some clues that we can use to estimate the block site. If the P interval is more than 280 milliseconds, so uh, the block it might be a superhesion, but if the TR interval is less than 160 milliseconds, the blocks are maybe intrahesion or the infrahesion. 
And in uh, the ECG, we, we know that the PR interval is uh, less than 160 milliseconds. So uh, we can uh, assume that maybe the block is in intrahesion or in the extrahesion. And uh, the next point is uh, we can see from the QS, QRS width. If the QRS is narrow, uh, we can uh, predict maybe the block is uh, superhesion or intrahesion. But if the QRS is wide, Maybe it, it was, we can say that we, maybe it, uh, it was an uh, infrahesion. Like in this ECG, uh, the QRS is white, so uh, maybe it's uh, infrahesion block. And uh, we also can do some, uh, some uh, maneuver, like do some exercise or give the uh, atropine to uh, the patient to, to know uh, if the exercise or the atropine will improve the FE block or not. So if the exercise or the atropine improves the uh, FE block, uh, so maybe uh, the block is in every node or superhesion, but if the uh, exercise or atropine worsen the FE block, so uh, it could be the intra or infrahesion. Uh, in our, our, in our case, uh, the exercise no, atropine uh, didn't uh, uh, show no improvement and no exact improvement in the ECG. So uh, because it is uh, not really uh, conclusive, so we do the uh, electrophysiology study. So here is the electrograms. First, uh, uh, the, EC, uh, the electrograms show the with QRS, and then uh, we also can see the uh, age to A to H interval was normal with the 97 millisecond with the H to V interval is uh, prolonged with 93 uh, millisecond. And we also can see the splitting of his uh, in these electrograms. And the H or uh, H to A to H uh, followed with the bench card are Deflection. So, uh, from this EGM, we conclude that the block is in partition, and then we uh, uh, we decide to implant the permanent pacemaker to this patient. So, for the conclusion, of course, we determining the block site of the two to one FE block is important to decide whether the patient needs the permanent pacemaker or not. And the uh, surface so atrophic ECG can be a functional invasive diagnostic, diagnostic modality to estimate the block site of the if you block to, uh, to one, if you block before doing the electrophysiology study, that uh, more invasive uh, modality. Okay, uh, that's all that uh, we can uh, present. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Nisa, for a very nice presentation. If you go back to the 12 lead ECG, I'd like to ask you we have shown clearly, you know, with an EP study with a catheter at the his position showing intrahistian conduction. Uh, abnormality. If you go back to the ECG, yeah, the 12 lead. Oh, okay, you stop there. I would like to tell us what are some of the high risk features that you see that prompt you to do an EP study if you're uncertain. Okay, thank you for the question. So, uh, from this ECG, uh, we uh, we can see that the PR interval is uh, less than one uh, one hundred and sixty well, milliseconds. So uh, maybe uh, the sorry, yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, let's go back to the twelve lead. Just tell us just the features on the twelve lead that prompt you uh, to you know, to be to be you are more worried for this patient. What are the features that are... Uh, yeah, go okay. ahead. So okay. one, you told me that with two is to one, normal PR interval, that's worrisome. You're correct. That's worrisome. Yeah. What yeah. other feature is that? Okay, uh, other feature is uh, the, the white QRS that uh, uh, as long as we know, it, uh, it can be a, a sign that maybe the blood is... Uh, in, in Frahesian, in the bundle, bra bundle branch. All right, so uh, 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 YQRS suggests that uh, 
uh, the, the only fascicle is conducting. There's only one fascicle that's conducting left. All right. And then you show me an, a strip of ECG where there is a conducted QRS. Would you go to that? Okay. Next. Next one. Next. Yes. You see uh, on the right half of this strip, there is some conducted beats, isn't it? Yeah. Next QRS. How do you account for that? And what do you what are some of the uh, subtle features that you worry about? Mm. Okay, it would uh, be great to have this on the 12 lead ECG so you could look at the conducted beat, which is the one, two, three, four, the fifth beat. You know, uh, uh, we could then there's a fifth conducted beat. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, this one. The, yeah. yeah, this one. Uh, the Would you, fifth, how do you explain for that? Yeah, uh, I think the the, the fifth uh, the fifth bit here is uh, just like the uh, uh, atrial atrial escape junction. So maybe uh, actually uh, this one uh, is uh, is not is not coming from the the ventricle ventricle bit. I think. Okay, so um, you are showing this two is to one with one extra beat. So it will be useful to measure the P to P interval when it's two is to one versus the P to P interval when it's uh, conducted. And you see if there's mm -hmm. any shortening or lengthening of the P to P interval. If the P to P interval lengthens and is conducted, this is suggestive of an infrahesian conduction delay. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to thank you for your nice presentation of... Uh, uh, infrahesian conduction abnormality and these are some of the easy features that you have hi hi highlighted that we should pay uh, and take, take attention. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for yes, uh, comments. Any other comments from Sofian for this case before we move on? Uh, uh, yes, I mean, given that we have a general audience, I don't want the audience to go away uh, from this case thinking you've got to do an EP study when you see this kind of case. I think this is... Um, if I remember the correct patient symptomatic. So I think uh, it's a fairly cut and dried case. You've got someone with what, faced, what appears to be two to one block with a wired QRS complex. And on that alone, you can assume that it's quite likely there's going to be some interfacing disease. And therefore the uh, conduction system is not going to be not reliable and you're going to just need to pace. So that's what you do practically. If uh, you had any doubt, then you could of course do an EP study. You saw the split his. Uh, already, which suggests intrahisian delay, and you can see um, absence of a conducted um, beat following the his signal, which again suggests intrahisian disease. So, yeah, intrahisian disease. So, this patient has got intra and infrahisian disease with a wide QRS. So, I think that um, two to one block symptoms are going to need pacing. The other thing I would say is the ECG itself is not quite typical for left bundle branch block, uh, it's almost more like intraventricular conduction delay. Uh, but that's something that uh, we could look at with another ECG. But uh, nice, nicely done. Well done. Thanks for those comments, Sophia. So we'll now move on to Malaysia with Dr. Fang's case from Kedah. Dr. Fang, please. Dr. Fang, uh, are you still muted? Maybe you'd like to unmute yourself before you start. Hi, sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening. I'm Pan from Hospital Susana Bahia. Uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to participate in this prestigious event. Uh, my case today is a 60 years old lady whose aortic valve replacement presented with sudden onset of shortness of breath. And this is the 12 lead ECG that reveals a white complex tachycardia. So let's dissect this ECG together. Uh, first of all, we will see that there is presence of inverted P weight in the lead V1. Uh, QRS complexness is white at 200 milliseconds with an extreme, uh, right exit, uh, extreme axis deviations evidenced by a positive AVR with negative 2,3 AVR. And the calculated rate using every other bits method is at about 225 bits per minute. So summing up, this ECG shows a regular inverted P wave with a white QRS complex with an extreme axis deviation with a heart rate of 225. 
Looking at this, I think our main differentials will be either be an SVT with apparency or a ventricular tachycardia. So to confirm the diagnosis with this, we apply a Bugada's criteria for this uh, on this ECG. You can see that the RS complexes are present in the pre-body leads with intervals uh, measured at 40 milliseconds. And from the lead V1, we could see that there's no clear AV dissociation. Uh, comparing the right bundle branch morphology is not in keeping with VT, as is the rabbit ear is taller over the right side. So summing up uh, the, on the Bugada's algorithm, this ECG is actually uh, more in favor of SVT. So, however, what SVT rhythm is this? This we managed to capture the initiation of the tachycardia, but unfortunately, we were un unable to capture the termination of it. From the initiation, we could see that there is a PVC and also an ectopic leak uh, that initiate this tachycardia, followed by a conducted aberrant beat and triggering this tachycardia. We managed to get the baseline ECG for this lady, and fortunately, we actually managed to capture one of the ECG that shows an intermittent right under branch block. So in determining of the underlying SVD rhythm, we were considering whether it's an atrial tachycardia uh, AV nodal reentrant tachycardia or AV ventricle reentrant tachycardia. So looking at this, we could measure that the RP interval is actually prolonged, and in fact, it's long as seven more than seventy milliseconds. So uh, we think that this ECG is more in keeping of an atrial tachycardia with a right bundle branch block or aberrancy. And Locating the tachycardia, we can see that the P wave is negative in V1 and V2, and it's positive in, in the NT really. So, postulated that the AT is possibly originating from tricuspid annulus or a right atrial appendage. However, we do, we, we do acknowledge that the limitation of this ECG um, in locating AT due to the, the possible anatomical variation and also a recent surgery, and the limitation of the ECG to detect. Uh, any dual pathology such or vesicular VT. Ultimately, an EP study will be required for confirmation and treatment of this disease. That's good. Thank you. Thanks very much. Shall we just keep the tachycardia ECG on? So I think we'll hear from subsequent presentations a bit more about this, but basically this is a problem that you see quite commonly in accident emergency. So you have this uh, lady who's 60 years old with an ADR, uh, so uh, basically, uh, then you're faced with this dilemma, is this SVT or VT? You look at the Brugada algorithm and uh, it shows SVT. Uh, and if you look at one of the algorithms we look at later, I'm sure the AVR algorithm, Berakai algorithm, actually it's probably more on the SVT side as well, even uh, because we look at AVR. If it's positive, clearly positive in AVR, it's very suggestive VT, but if you can see here, is actually initial negative deflection in AVR, which is quite short. And if you see something like that, it's against possibly the idea of uh, VT. Um, as the speaker has said, if you have something that looks very much like typical right bundle branch block, which you see the uh, sort of like taller rabbit ear on the right hand side in V1, uh, you also see a wide S wave in V5 and V6, which is again in keeping with right bundle branch block. And these two, three, and AVF have a slightly inferior axis. Again, all keeping the typical right bundle branch block. So the differential diagnosis, as he said, for a wide complex tachycardia with one-to-one -one conduction from V to A still lies with um, SVT with uh, aberrancy, either AVNR, atypical AVNRT or AVRT, or atrial tachycardia, or ventricular tachycardia as well, with conduction back to atrium. Um, so uh, this is also what we consider a long RP tachycardia. So the, Q, the QRS to uh, R wave to the interval from R to P is actually longer than the RR interval, so more than half, uh, more than half the RR interval, which uh, also results in certain differential diagnosis. So I know this patient was cardioverted, but I think it would be quite interesting to know what the response was to adenosine. Uh, that would actually help with the mechanism a bit. The other thing is that if you're thinking about AVNRT, for example, as a possible diagnosis here, which is a form of SVT, uh, she actually did have um, AVR. So usually with an atrial valve operation, they do um, 
possibly have some damage to the conducting system uh, and the AV node itself. So it might make AVNLT uh, less likely. Overall, um, I'm not totally sure that I would say that this is definitely natural tachycardia with one-to-one uh, -one conduction uh, conducted aberrantly. I must admit, overall on balance, I still think this could be an um, AVNRT, perhaps an atypical form with aberrant conduction, or perhaps a uh, slowly conducting uh, pathway resulting in uh, AVRT, atrial ventricular rate tachycardia. So a lot of things to say. Personally, I think my next step here would be to give adenosine as a diagnostic maneuver and then take it from there. This is probably what I would do in the emergency department. Quite a few things to think about. Uh, and I suppose, and I think my colleague may actually have some further comments on this one. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Sophia. Oh, I, I, no, nothing to end actually. Uh, Sophia has illustrated uh, all the nuances very well. Yeah, I would tr give a trial of adenosine with, uh, with and be ready to cardiovert the patient as needed. And the adenosine will give you valuable clues as to the etiology of this uh, tachycardia. Over to you. Thanks. Thanks. I'm, I'm very happy to say that you guys all think adenosine as a maneuver is very safe. Can I just ask one last question on Chikyong then? In the Bugatta criteria, they always talk about the rabbit ear left taller than right and whatnot. Can you explain to me about the rabbit ear? Because I'm always confused. Okay, so uh, it's R, R, RSR, so the, the RS, the second R on the V1 refers to the rabbit ear. And what you see when the RSR, the R prime, the second R is taller than the first R, is it goes for a typical right bundle branch block morphology. And hence, you think of conduction down the interventricular septum with the right bundle branch block. So you entertain the possibility of SVT with right bundle branch block aberrancy. If the first R is taller, then that's unusual. That's atypical right bundle branch block. It makes yeah. SVT aberrancy highly unlikely. <clears throat> Thanks. Finally, I understand. Right. Thanks a lot. <laughs> so we'll go now to Dr. Chi from Malaysia as well to talk to us about his interesting title case. Dr. Chi, please. Full screen, if you can. Can you see my slide? Uh, it's not on full screen at the moment though. Yeah, no? now it looks good. Go ahead. Yeah, good day everyone. I'm Chi here. Before I begin, I would like to thank APSC for giving me the opportunity to share this case with you all. He is a 48 year old with ischemic diacalamal party of ejection fraction 35%. He presented to ED in the district hospital with palpitation. Hemodynamically wise, he was stable. And this was his ECG upon presentations. And as you all can appreciate, this is a white complex tachycardia with a heart rate of 209 beats per minute. QS complexes is 160 millisecond. Axis one is right axis deviations with uh, the Q wave in lead one, AVL, V1, V2, and V6. He was treated as a SVT with aberrancy. In this case, they think it's an RBBB. We had denosine six and 12 milligram but to no avail and the blood pressure dropped and he has to be cardioverted. And this was the ECG post cardioversions. As you all can see, he was back to sinus rhythm with a heart rate of 85 beats per minute, QRS 240 millisecond, with the axis still remain as right axis deviations. But here we can appreciate more Q wave in the lead one, AVL, V1 to V5, with underlying uh, right by the branch block. And from the district hospital, they refer us as refractory SVT because from what they see in the tachycardia and in sinus rhythm, in terms of morphology wise, the axis remain right axis deviations, right axis deviation, sorry. And the morphology is about the same. So in this case, I also apply the Bugada algorithm. As you all don't get the a lot of uh, SVT versus VD discriminator, but in this case, Let's say we look at the first step. Is there any negative uh, concordance? Uh, in the leaf V3 to V5, clearly there is an R wave. So in this uh, step, it's no. So we proceed to the next step. With the onset of the R wave to the nadir of S wave, in this case, it's 80 milliseconds. So it doesn't fulfill. And in terms of the third step, we go through the ECG. 
we can't find any AV dissociation. So we go back to the, uh, we go to the last step, which is the morphology criteria. And in this case, we can see the QR in the lead V1, and there's a QS pattern in the lead V6. So we think this patient most likely is a VT, especially when this patient is ischemic diabetic cardiomyopathy with ejection fraction of 35%. But one thing strikes us is the QI's duration. In sinus rhythm, his QI's duration is uh, 200, I can't see my slide here, it's 240 milliseconds. While in the tachycardia, the QI's duration was, so, uh, was shortened about 60 milliseconds to 100, 160 milliseconds. So the, the question is, why the QS duration got shortened by 80 milliseconds compared to sinus rhythm? The only explanation is in sinus rhythm with right by the branch block, there will be sequential activations of left ventricular followed by right ventricular with the, under, uh, with the underlying right by the branch block. But in this case of ventricular tachycardia, with the foci very near to the septum, it will be, there will be simultaneous activation of left ventricle with the right ventricle. Thereby, it can shorten the QIS duration by 80 milliseconds. And for this uh, gentleman, we implanted an ICD for him. And during the device interrogation, uh, we appreciate there's a more ventricular signal than atrial signal. So we uh, click the diagnosis of VT. And if you look at the far field ECG, as most of the patients, uh, ICD was implanted on the left side. It will be very similar to our lead tree. And we look at the tachycardia cycle line here, 290 to 300. It's very similar to the tachycardia that he had when he presented to the district hospital, which is about 209. And 290 milliseconds is about 200 to 210 like that. So we conclude, this one most likely is a similar tachycardia. So the take-home messages that I want to bring up is, the first is white complex tachycardia in those patients with cardiomyopathy should be treated as ventricular tachycardia. The second is, relative narrowing of QIS complexes during tachycardia suggests ventricular tachycardia. With this, I thank you all. Thank you so much for a very nice presentation. Would you go to the slide which shows the tachycardia, ECG, and the sinus ECG? Sure. Maybe while you are going through that, where, where do you think is the site of VT? We think this is in the LV, but in the mid LV, but it's very, very near to the septum. Okay. I think you are, I, I do agree with you. Let's go through that. Yes. A few pointers uh, would be uh, yeah, just a slide with the ECG, with the uh, QRS. And so, ah, that's very good. Okay. So a few things, a uh, very nice presentation. Number one, number, number two, if you look, although both have right axis deviation, you will appreciate that uh, during tachycardia, lead two and, and uh, lead three uh, is more positive than sinus rhythm. For example, in lead two, is RS with predominant S, whereas in lead two during tachycardia is a prominent R. Both have right axis deviation, but both axis deviated maybe about 60 degrees or so. That's number one. Number two, uh, you pointed out a uh, right button branch block in V1 during sinus rhythm, but it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, you know, it's a little Q for by R, isn't it, in sinus rhythm? Where else if you look during tachycardia? There's a small, little, small, almost R-like. Uh, if I can see correctly, you know, uh, you could correct me if I'm wrong. So subtle differences in the right button branch block even during uh, tachycardia. So with this, and thirdly, you mentioned that QRS duration is shorter during tachycardia. Uh, a very good observation because if the VT is distal to the site of bundle branch block, that would result in a narrow QRS duration during VT because you have bypassed the block. So wherever this VT is, it will be distal to the site of right bundle branch block. Uh, good illustration and confirm with a VDD ICD which shows VT with V more than A. Congratulations. Thanks, bro. Thanks, uh, Chikyong. Great points. Uh, Sophia, anything to add? 
Yeah, I was just going to say that if adenosine doesn't work and with a wide complex tachycardia, you probably, according to, for example, the most recent ACLS guidelines from the AHA, you try adenosine basically once because they don't really want you to waste time giving adenosine several times uh, if you're happy to give enough adenosine in, a card in trying to convert a wide complex tachycardia because that kind of um, uses a bit of time. So I think in looking at the actual clinical course of the case, I'd probably just try dancing once. Had, if I was happy, I gave a reasonable dose and it did what, and it did have a physiological effect and that would be sufficient. The other thing uh, to note is that on the VT, I think, the VT itself was negative in one ABL, B5 and B6. And if you look at the sinus rhythm ECG, it was also, Q waves are also present in one AVL B5 and B6, so a sort of a lateral scar. So that, uh, so if you see that if you see that ECG and also the VT, it does suggest that actually uh, the scar in the lateral area uh, and uh, the VT exit site also is kind of like in the lateral sort of area, possibly uh, in the basal lateral area. So that kind of also uh, some ECG clues that tell you. Uh, that this is uh, VT uh, after the fact, of course, after you convert the patient back to sinus rhythm. So if you had a sinus rhythm ECG already, and these patients often do, you already know where the sort of scar is. And if you're good at localizing the exit side of the VT, if the VT site matches the scar, then that gives you much more confidence that it's VT. But I have to say that based on history alone, ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy, nine times out of 10 is going to be VT. So you know why complex tachycardia and someone with history of cardiomyopathy, you really ought to assume this is VT until proven otherwise, at least in terms of immediate clinical management. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Sophia. Now we'll go on to Julian from Singapore for his case. The case, again, of white complex tachycardia. So it's really a master course on VT, SVT. Julian, please. Uh, thanks, Dr. Jack. Uh, greetings from Singapore. I'm Julian. This is my case. So this is a 54 years old male with significant history of ischemic heart disease who refused prior revascularization in 2014. His prior LVEF was 45%. He presented to us with giddiness and palpitations of two days in duration. He denied other symptoms of angina, heart failure, or syncope. This was the initial ECG on presentation, and we can appreciate a white complex, relatively reg uh, white, uh, relatively white complex, regular tachycardia with a QR duration of 120 milliseconds and a ventricular rate of 153 beats per minute. There are several differentials for a white complex tachycardia, but the crux is to discriminate between VT and SVT with aberrancy. We have heard from the earlier speakers that there are several algorithms out there, uh, of which Bugada algorithm and the Barricade criteria is one of those more common ones. So if you utilize the Bugada criteria, uh, there is no AV dissociation that you can see here, fusion or capture bit. Precardio QRS morphology appears to be atypical right bundle branch block like V1 and v V1 with an RS pattern. And then you have a QR pattern in V6, and there's an early transition in V1 to V2. If we look at the axis, there's a left superior axis, as you can see here. And if you look at the Verricade criteria, unfortunately, it doesn't fulfill the Verricade criteria as it's not positive in AVR. But the R to S is borderline at 40 milliseconds. So, well, given the underlying clinical background and the ECG features in this patient, VT seems most likely, but there are some interesting observations in this ECG. Firstly, we can see distinct P waves across all 12 feet shown in the red boxes, and they are all negatively deflected in the inferior leads, suggesting that these are retrograde P waves. Number two, there is one to one VA conduction with a VA time of 169 milliseconds. This coupled findings with a slurred QRS, uh, akin to a delta wave, makes antidromic ABRT a possible differential in this situation. Secondly, there's consistent negative deflection prior to each QRS, seen in the best in the inferior leads, and this raises concerns that this patient could have concomitant atrial flutter as the morphology appears to be similar to the retrograde T waves. So these are our differentials at this juncture. A VT was more likely but there are some concerns of antidromic S AVRT plus possible concomitant atrial flutter. So given that the patient was hemodynamically stable with concerns of possible pre-excitation and atrial flutter, we gave IV procanamide in this patient. Uh, this did not terminate the tachycardia, but we can appreciate, nor the change in the QRS morphology, but we can appreciate that there is 
a slight slowing down of the tachycardia to 114 beats per minute. And you can see that there's no change in the VA time, suggestive of very good VA linkage. And the QRS, as you can see here, there's a negative deflection here as well. And this suggests that this is just part of the QRS morphology and this rules out a flutter. Given the persistence of, of the white complex tachycardia, we gave IV amiodarone next. At first glance, the ECG seems similar, but there were some changes in the P waves and we can focus in lead two. So here's a zoom view of lead two. The red arrows denote the QRS wave that is of a sim uh, similar cycle length, uh, while the crosses denote P waves. If we inspect uh, all this closely, we can see that it seems to be every fourth bit missing P waves with a VA prolongation before the fourth drop bit. This relationship is consistent across the 12th ECG, and this makes antidromic AVRT less likely because it requires one to one AV relationship to complete a circuit. So if we translate this to a ladder diagram, um, it will look like this, and this is VA rank to back phenomenon in the patient with intact VA conduction. So we, in, we went further to uh, investigate the VA relationship, given that the patient had persistent white complex tachycardia despite IV and Maduro. And as you can see here, the rates went up back to 150 to 160 bits per minute. And after IV adenosine up to 18 milligrams, there was no termination of the VT, but we can appreciate AV dissociation, a VA dissociation here now. And this is because adenosine is an AV nodal blocking agent. And therefore, given that it did not interrupt the tachycardia, but it causes VA dissociation, this confirms that our patient has diagnosis of VT with initial one-to-one -one VA conduction. So patient had to undergo cardioversion because there was no response to any medication, including amiodarone. And after cardioversion, we can appreciate that there are no delta waves in this ECG. And there are actually Q waves seen in 238 VF suggesting of prior infarct from the underlying ischemic heart disease. So in summary, my patient has a ventricular tachycardia, likely a scar re-entrant VT from ischemic heart disease with initial presentation of what appears to be a white complex tachycardia of 120 milliseconds with atypical right bundle branch block morphology early V1, V2 transition with a left superior axis. There's intact VA reconduction which sit with initial 1 to 1 VA conduction, which then degenerates because of amiodarone, which is an AV blocking agent as well, to VA Vankivec and VA dissociation with adenosine. In terms of localization, the exit site uh, is likely the basal inferior, inferior septal LV area, which was further confirmed on a recent VT study that we did for this patient, and we had successful sub uh, subject modification for this patient. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, very nice presentation, Julian. Just go to ECG number four. Uh, I will just confine myself to just a couple of points. Uh, what's interesting actually during the adenosine challenge uh, basically is that you can see here when during the VT, uh, you see the P waves inverted in the inferior lead. So basically, uh, conduction is going backwards up the AV node, so it's retrograde, so the P waves inverted. If you actually look at the uh, P waves after adenosine is given, they become upright because these are sinus. So that's a, kind of a nice uh, demonstration of um, the P wave morphology changing uh, with adenosine in someone with VA, uh, VT and VA conduction. Uh, the other thing that's uh, VA linking is actually, you can see that there. You see the polarity of the P wave changes actually after the adenosine. So that tells you that the P waves are now positive, so kind of a sinus, sinus uh, node. So that's another clue uh, to help you as well. The other thing about VA linking that may not be appreciated is that VA linking really basically means here that the rhythm is being drive, driven from the ventricle. So the VA interval doesn't change. Uh, when, despite the tachycardia cycle and changing when you give your drugs like amiodarone and cocainamide. So it tells you it's coming from V. So if it's coming from V, by definition, it's T. And uh, one last point is that the, the ECG of the VT is negative 2, 3 in ABF, which means it's uh, uh, coming from the inferior wall. Uh, again, uh, from the 12B ECG after the uh, VT is cardioverted, you also see Q waves there, suggesting scar the area. So all this kind of is in keeping with inferior scar. Uh, so if you have a 12B ECG, um, that actually is a real help in helping you decide the localization of VT as well, uh, in general. Uh, the other thing to say is that VA conduction is not common in VTs. If it's uh, present, it's usually at slower uh, VTs. The faster VT, the less likely you are to get VA conduction. So it's just another point. Very nice presentation. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Sophia and Julian. And now we're going to maybe hopefully change tracks from VT 
to Dr. Go to present on a case of exceptional dyspnea with T inversion on the ECG. Dr. Go, please. Would you like to unmute yourself first, Dr. Go? Okay, uh, hi everyone. Uh, today I'll be presenting a case of T-wave inversions accompanied by exertional dyspnea. This is a 75-year-old lady. She attended the cardiology clinic for preoperative cardiac evaluation prior to a nephroureterectomy due to her complaints of exertional dyspnea. Of note, she had a medical history of uncorrected congenital diaphragmatic hernia and she had no history of IHD. On examination, uh, she has dual heart sounds and they are loudest on the right side of the chest and on the left side of the chest, bowel sounds were audible. Okay, this is her ECG and there were no prior ECGs for comparison. So it shows sinus rhythm and the most obvious abnormality here are the widespread T-wave inversions. On closer look, we can also see progressively decreasing R-wave voltages across the precordial leads. The axis is normal and both P and QRS are positive in 1 and AVL uh, and negative in AVR. In the preoperative setting, she was worked up very extensively for causes of ischemia. Transthoracic echocardiogram and dipyridomal MPI were both unremarkable and we eventually confirmed a very large diaphragmatic hernia and its spatial relationship to the heart on CT thorax. The CT shows very significant white, uh, rightward shift and counterclockwise rotation of the heart and great vessels, with now the left ventricle and right ventricle being similarly anterior structures. The left lung was very compressed as well by the herniated bowel, which is likely to have been the cause for her exertional dyspnea. So now going back to the ECG, uh, this is a case of what is known as cardiac dextroposition, which is a displacement of the heart to the right secondary to extracardiac causes. Dextroposition is a bit different from dextrocardia, where the apex of the heart itself is pointing towards the right. The ECG at the top is our patient's ECG, and then the one at the bottom is an example of the ECG in dextrocardia. So I'm just going to go through some similarities and differences. Both dextroposition and dextrocardia show decreasing R wave amplitudes across the precordial leads. Um, however, in dextroposition, uh, the overall QRS complex is still predominantly positive in the left sided leads whereas in dextrocardia, they are predominantly negative. And this is because the electrical axis of the heart is still leftward in dextroposition, just that the heart has been pushed towards the right, whereas in dextrocardia, the electrical axis is rightward. Now, secondly, classically in dextrocardia, there's an inverted P wave and negative QRS complex in 1 and AVL, and then an upright P and a positive QRS in AVR. And these changes are because of the rightward electrical axis, and they are not seen in dextroposition. Uh, now, probably what about the T-wave inversions then? This one is a little bit less clear in the literature, although others have also reported uh, widespread T-wave inversions and even ST elevations in cardiac extraposition from giant hiatal hernias, and they resolved after surgical correction. In our case, our patient declined surgery for the hernia, so we couldn't assess whether her ECG changes would have resolved. There are a few possible explanations for these T-wave inversions. It could be altered T-wave vector due to the right-sided positioning of the heart. Uh, similarly, in children where they demonstrate precordial T-wave inversions due to a posteriorly directed repolarization wave front in right-sided dominance. Um, however, it's definitely unusual in our case that the limb leads were also affected, suggesting that right-sided dominance is unlikely to be the only explanation. Um, another possible mechanism is pericardial irritation from the adjacent herniated bowel this one might be more applic applicable to cases where they notice ST changes, such as ST elevation. Um, and then lastly, it's also possible that there could have been compression of the vagal innervation going to the heart and hence affecting myocardial repolarization. And similarly, in autonomic nervous disturbance uh, that we see in intracranial hemorrhage, sometimes there are T-wave inversions such as in SAH. So it could be a similar mechanism. Uh, I'll end off with a few learning points. There's a very broad differential diagnosis for T-wave inversions, and in very rare cases, it could be cardiac dextroposition. And there are key differences in the ECG in dextroposition and dextrocardia, specifically the P-wave and QRS axis in leads 1 and AVR. 
And in cases of dextral position, good clinical examination is very important and thoracic imaging is helpful for a definitive diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very nice presentation. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll just have some quick comments. Anytime you see reverse hallway progression on the precordial leaves, you really have to suspect dextrocardia, and you will follow this up with a chest X-ray. The other thing is that dextrocardia usually just means the heart is on the left side, oh, sorry, uh, sorry, in the right side. Uh, so sometimes uh, people do refer to this as dextrocardia, but further characterizes by saying the apex is pointing to the right. Very nice, and uh, you discover the cause of the dextro position uh, and uh, the differential diagnosis there. But I guess a chest x ray actually would help tell you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, that was very nice. Uh, we'll now move on to Dr. Cheng from Taiwan to close up with the last uh, case presentation. Okay, hello everybody. I'm Dr. Chen Wei from National Taiwan University Hospital. I'm a cardiology fellow. Today I'm going to present an interesting ECG case. This is an 84 year old woman with epigastric pain for hours. And she has the past medical histories of spontaneous ICH a month ago with neurological sequela of right hemiparesis. Besides, she also has CKD stage four. This time the patient was admitted to the other hospital for rehabilitation. However, during admission, she suffered from acute onset of epigastric pain. A thorough evaluation was performed, including a 12 lead ECG. And the impression of the ECG was ST elevation MI. So the patient was transferred to our hospital for primary PCI. This is the initial ECG at the other hospital. The most obvious abnormality is that there was diffuse ST elevation in multiple leads, including lead 1, 2, AVO, AVF, and O6 precordial leads. Besides, there was also a dip in vertical T wave in lead AVR. So under the impression of ST elevation MI, the patient was transferred to our hospital. However, when the patient arrived, the ECG at our triage showed no more ST elevation on the ECG. And I was consulted for the primary PCI. However, at the time, I was just wondering that, uh, should I activate the cath lab or not? So I performed the echocardiography first, and the echo showed that the patient LV contractility was preserved and there was no regional wall motion abnormality. And because the ECG showed no more ST elevation, so I decided to closely monitor the patient. And during follow-up, the lab data showed that there was no meaningful change of the serum troponin T level. So how to explain the initial ECG change? I contact with my attending physician and she, he told me that it was an electromechanical association artifact. And it was an artifact because of several reasons. First, if you look at the morphology of the STT chain, the shape of the elevated ST segment was bizarre. And in lead one and lead two, ST elevation seemed to start it before the QRS complex. And second, the ST elevation was not limited to one territory of coronary artery. And there was no reciprocal change. So the STD change due to myocardial infarction was less likely. And if we look at the long little strip, you can see that the STD deviation occurred at a fixed interval. It happened with every QRS complex, which indicated that it was synchronized with the cardiac contraction. And in the long little strip, the ST elevation comes and goes in, in the long little strip. You can see in the first, three beats, the ST elevation became higher, and then it became lower in the following four beats, and it, it became higher and lower again. So the most likely reason that could explain this kind of ECG pattern is that it was due to the artifact and with the electro contact with the positing artery. So if it was an artifact, which electrode was the source? You can see that the maximal amplitude of the artifact happened in lead one, two, and AVR. And there was no artifact in lead three. An artifact became smaller in lead AVO, AVF, and O6 precordial leads. So the artifact was produced by the intermittent contact of the RA electrolyte with the positing artery. Here is the illustration. 
the Antoven triangles, uh, except for the right leg. The only electrode that did not be involved in it three is the right arm. So the right arm is the source of the artifact. So if the artifact happen in right arm, according to the potential, the equation of potential difference, the maximal amplitude of the artifact will happen in this one, two, and ABR. And the artifact will become smaller in AVF, AVL, and become even more smaller in this precordial lead, according to the equation. So uh, just act like our patient ECG. Thank you for your attention. All right, thank you, Dr. Lian. A very good description of a very bizarre ST elevation seen more in the limb leads than precordial and uh, unusual pattern that you can't localize to a certain territory. Uh, arterial tapping artifacts giving rise to bizarre ST elevation has been reported. My question to you would be, uh, were you able to reproduce this bizarre ST elevation ECG by putting the electrode on the pulsating right arm artery? Uh. I think if we have the uh, chance at the time, we can uh, reproduce it at, at the bedside. But at the time, uh, we didn't do this kind of uh, maneuver. So I'm not sure that if I can reproduce it or not. But if the patient and if, if the artery is there, I think it might be reproducible. Yeah. This is, uh, yeah, this is great. Yes, if you can reproduce it, you can conclusively you know, attribute to the arterial tapping artifact giving rise to bizarre ST elevation. Maybe I'd like to ask Dr. Jack Tan, you know, being an interventionalist, uh, the ST seems to have resolved. Uh, would you be reassured or confident of not assessing the coronary arteries? So thanks, thanks, uh, Chi Kyung. So whenever the ECG doesn't quite correspond, especially the patient no longer have symptoms. Uh, two things I think of, uh, besides artifactual ones, there's a wrong ECG from a wrong patient uh, case as well. So you have to take note of that one first. This one clearly looks very, very odd because the, like what was pointed out, the territories doesn't really quite correspond. We tend to say that it has to be two contiguous leads. So in the case, it's always anterior, inferior, or posterior. In this case, you can see that the lead ST elevation, uh, elevation here may be a high inferior, but it doesn't quite contiguous with the inferior lead. So there's something not quite right going on. So the next approach I would advise people to do is put on a 2D echo, make sure you can visualize whether there's um, a regional wall or not. If not, uh, I don't think you should immediately bring this patient to the cath lab. Repeating an ECG is a good idea, uh, especially if you're worried about artifacts or wrong ECG. On the or even a wrong patient. Uh, thanks, uh, Chi Kyung. So a uh, very, very good uh, case, actually, Dr. Cheng, to be congratulated and very, very nice one, which I haven't seen before. So uh, we'll come to the hour, actually. So we'll ask um, Dr. Cheng to stop share his slides. Uh, at the end, I'm getting my guys very busy trying to collect the result, which we'll announce in two minutes. Before we do that, I'd like to ask for my last teaching closing remarks from our two judges, from Sophia and first. Thank you very much, Jack. I think uh, basically uh, the only thing I will say is, I think there's a theme here of SVT versus VT. The, I think the main thing to remember is an emergent situation is that you will not remember these algorithms. The basic is why or it's not. And I think that uh, if you suspect an SVT, give it MCM once uh, and it doesn't work, can't you? This is for the stable patient. Uh, the second thing would be is that arterial tapping artifacts. Uh, just be aware of patients on hemodialysis with uh, AV fistulas in the arms. You can see quite marked tapping artifacts in patients if they put the electrode on the fistula. So that's just something, uh, a tip as well. Thank you. Thanks, Sophia. Uh, Chi Kyung? Yeah, so, uh, so broadly two categories, uh, one, you know, bradycardias and ECG morphology and the other is tachycardias. My advice is if the patient has a blood pressure, he is breathing well, saturating well, talking to you, then uh, regardless of the rhythm, be chill and take your time. You have some time to react to it 
and go through the various maneuvers. You know, uh, we, I think we've mentioned a test dose of, a good test dose of adenosine helps. Uh, be prepared to shock the patient, which you intend to anyway at the end of the encounter. And that will give you priceless clues on the uh, mechanism of arrhythmia for that patient. Uh, nice ECGs, uh, congratulations. And with morphology or artifacts, it'd be great if you could reproduce it. You could then conclusively show your audience that, hey, I've, there was my hypothesis. I reproduce it as with electrophysiology. If it's repeatedly reproducible, we pay attention to it and we deal with it. Over to you, Jack. Thanks. So now is the last chance for our fellows to ask the questions uh, if it has not been answered. So um, any questions from the fellows? Anything at all you'd like to ask our faculty? Don't, don't be shy. Um, maybe I'll go around. Uh, Dr. Lang? I just want to say it's a great presentation for everyone. Um, personally, I don't have any questions to ask. Okay. Um, anyone else? If not, um, I would like to go for the result. We look like we have a tight result. So, um, Chi Kyung, can you make some comments first or adjudicate the results before I announce it? Um, sorry. How, how do you want me to do it? Um, no, it's okay. Um, can we um, just uh, share screen? I'm going to announce the results now. So there, there is a tie. So uh, I'm going to promote uh, some of you to joint uh, prizes. So we're going to share screen for the results now. Thanks. Sam, can you share from your side? Are you um, okay, Sam? So, <coughs> so uh, we are going to One announce, second, coming. Yeah. So the format is that we're going to just uh, categorize. And first, let, let me just make my concluding remarks for your share screen. I really enjoyed today's uh, session. And uh, it was really very nice to see everyone catch up to share ECGs. And I'm very, very impressed by the quality of ECGs submitted from all the fellows. Everyone here that has been selected as winner because we had a lot of, lot of submissions. The format is that we're gonna have three top prizes and the rest are merit prizes. Everyone gets a prize, whoever has joined this session, well done. So we'll go on to the merit prizes first. Sam? So in merit prizes we have uh, from Australia, never skip a bit on pacing related complication from Australia, we like that a lot. Anissa talked about how to categorize a high risk, a two to one AV block, which was very, very instructive. Dr. Gil gave us a quick pointer on how to pick up dextrocardia, and that was very nice as well. Dr. Fang from uh, Malaysia also educated us on SVT versus VTs, very, very instructive. Next. So in we, we had a tie for the third prize, so there'll be two joints uh, first run up. Next. So we have Dr. Cheng from Taiwan, who gave us a last case that was, that was very nice, artifact uh, ST elevation, which I had not personally seen before, but a very, very good pickup. So that was a very, very good case. And the other joint uh, first runner up would be Dr. Chi Yishen from Malaysia, very, very nicely curated uh, SVT versus a VT right bundle and a very good teaching points. So uh, the judges like that. And the winner for today, so I'm seeing all this firsthand as well, Dr. Julian Tay from Singapore, congratulations. Again, a very, very well uh, narrated and uh, taught out case presentation for white complex uh, tachycardia. Next slide, please. 
So with that, um, I apologize for the time overrun. I really enjoyed today's uh, super duper session in conjunction with APSC 2022. And congratulations to all the participants and special thanks to my judges for putting in so much work for this session. Thank you and uh, good night. Keep safe. Bye-bye. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Bye, bye, everybody. Bye. Congratulations. Congrats. Bye-bye.